afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this afternoon's live call, Weathering the Coronavirus Market Downturn. My name is Darcy O'Brien, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Simon Quick, and I will be moderating today's discussion. First of all, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining us today, and I would encourage you to submit your questions. Our goal is to make these calls as interactive as possible, so please don't be shy. I also wanted to announce that next week's call will be held on Thursday the 23rd instead of our usual time on Wednesdays. I hope that you will be able to join us next Thursday at 4 p.m. I also wanted to share with the group that our head of financial planning, Bill Laylor, will be joining us on the call today. Towards the end of the call, he will be addressing a question that was submitted ahead of time on Roth conversions. That being said, if you have any other financial planning questions, please go ahead and submit them and Bill would be happy to address them today. On that subject, please note that questions can be submitted through the Q&A function on Zoom. You may also submit questions by emailing me at dobryan at simonquickadvisors.com. Please also note that this call is being recorded and will be posted to the resources section of our website tomorrow and circulated over email. Now, before I dive into the questions, please note the following disclaimers. This presentation is for information and discussion purposes only. Please remember that past performance may not be indicative of future results, and there is no guarantee that the concepts and ideas discussed during the presentation will be profitable or prove successful. Okay, so let's introduce our panelists. Today we have with us our Chief Investment Officer and Managing Partner, Chris Moore. Hi, Darcy. Hi, Chris. We also have our Head of Investment Research, Wayne Yi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Wayne. And lastly, we have our Head of Financial Planning, Bill Laylor. Thanks, Darcy. Glad to be on. Great. Okay. So I'm going to start with the questions we've received over email, and then we'll dive into the queue and respond to questions in the order in which they were received. The first question comes in from John. Has the market gotten ahead of itself because the curve is currently flattening? Has it given enough weight to the short and long-term repercussions of what could go down in history as one of the top two or three worst global economic disasters in modern times? How could portfolios be altered to protect against this? What does the ideal model portfolio look like today? I can take that one. Um, the market's response really in kind of the last two weeks uh, is in part due to the flattening of the curve, but I think more likely due to the stimulus package via the CARES Act and the activity of the Fed in quantitative easing and um, reducing interest rates now to zero over the last couple of weeks. I think the, the market's quick rebound in the past couple of weeks where it's, it's moved 20% higher from its low is very much a function of that stimulus providing um, comfort to investors uh, that the Fed and the Treasury are willing to step in and support markets uh, when pricing really gets out of whack like it did in March. Uh, the, the flattening of the curve is certainly helping investor sentiment uh, from a public health perspective uh, because it now looks like the, um, some of the worst case scenarios, at least in New York City, um, don't look likely to come to fruition. Uh, that is definitely um, improving kind of the psychology of investors. However, there are ample um, analyses out there showing very dire situations for the economy. Uh, and should the shutdown continue to last or ripple through to uh, a variety of industries and sectors, increasing bankruptcies, increasing unemployment, um, you know, some of the projections I've seen expect GDP growth to drop anywhere from, call it 20 to 30 percent in the second quarter, uh, unemployment to potentially hit 20 percent. Uh, so to, the, to John's question, this is, is definitely an environment where um, the economic landscape 
at least in the very short term, uh, could be far severe than, you know, it, it was in 2008 or even in prior bear markets. The the assumptions that I think a lot of uh, investors are making is that the snapback, um, whenever that comes, should uh, eliminate some of the severe drawdown that we'll likely see in the next two quarters. Now, whether or not this is a U-shaped recovery or V-shaped recovery or W-shaped recovery is still very much to be determined. Uh, but I do think there is an assumption that um, when behaviors change and individuals start going back to the store or um, you know going to a bar or to a restaurant or jumping on an airplane to make a sales call, uh, certainly maybe not as much as before, uh, but the expectation that at some point that will pick up again, uh, that is, I think, priced into this rally a little bit too. Uh, there, it's still very much to be determined when uh, the restart happens for the economy. Is it 30 days? Is it 60? Uh, is it 90? Is it longer? Uh, that is very unknown at this point. I think if if we see kind of a, a period where the economy doesn't restart till late fall, for example, that's not priced into the market. Um, we'll likely see further volatility in equities. How are we thinking about positioning portfolios accordingly? Amidst the decline, we've moved to kind of a neutral weight in equities but we've maintained a higher focus on quality. So within the equity portfolio, we've increased the quality of the companies that we're owning. So we're not as dependent on uh, what happens in the economy. We don't want to own the companies that will be most punished should the economy uh, weaken more than expected or have a longer downturn than expected at this point. The same is true for kind of fixed income portfolios. We're maintaining a bias towards quality, right? So we're not owning high yield. We're not owning leveraged loans. We're not owning the assets that will be most impacted by a severe and prolonged downturn in the economy. We're owning the assets that we want to own a year from now. Um, and you know, timing the bottom is impossible. Uh, the, the best approach is to kind of average in. So if we see a second wave or a testing of the lows, uh, that's likely when we'd be adding risk to portfolios. How, how are we capitalizing on this now? We're looking at more opportunistic strategies. Um, you know, those where the dislocations are enormous and haven't really recovered with this recent rally in equities. That could be in distressed. It could be in closed end funds. Um, we think there are a lot of really interesting um, structural components that have been heavily impacted, that haven't recovered, that we think are oversold and a great kind of risk return um, profile for investors. A lot of our clients are looking at this as an opportunity to um, take advantage of the volatility, take advantage of the fear in markets, take advantage of uh, of of dislocations and invest for the long term. You know, the clients that can look 12, 36 months out are going to be very happy with the return profile of the dollars that they're putting to work today. Thank you, Chris. Our next question comes in from Sandy. Given everything that is going on right now, what is the likelihood of deflation? Uh, this is Wayne. Uh, I can address some of that. Um, I think we're seeing some of it already. Uh, there's been a bunch of macro data on the U.S. that you see came out this morning that points to a slowing of the economy, uh, both from a production perspective as well as sales. Um, and just kind of some quick headlines. Retail, sa retail sales being down about nearly 9%. Uh, you're seeing manufacturing and production falling uh, on the, uh, falling uh, as a, on the latest reading as well. Fannie's predicting a 15% decline in volume in terms of home sales. So that's, that's not prices falling 15%, but that's the, the velocity or volume of transactions occurring. So you, you are seeing, at least in the short term, a slowdown in, uh, in activity. 
Um, and even in that retail number, uh, that number is probably a little bit higher than expected because, or a little bit better than expected because uh, purchases of consumer staples was actually higher than expected as people pulled forward all their toilet paper purchases and uh, any other kind of canned and dried goods because uh, a month ago, we just didn't know what the the path of uh, kind of being homebound would, would look like. So uh, we are seeing uh, the effects of a slowing economy with less uh, uh, with less uh, desire to spend money and also less ability to spend money. Um, oil prices plummeting as well. And yeah, we just got to a deal, uh, or OPEC and Russia just got to a deal of cutting production, but that is uh, way overshadowed by just a fall off in uh, in oil demand. So yeah, we're we're seeing that in the system right now. Um, the, the question is. With all the stimulus, with monetary and fiscal stimulus coming into the market, that will be inflationary. Um, the question is, when does that really kick in? And over the longer term, we will be back into an inflationary economy. But uh, over the next course of the next quarter, uh, or a little beyond that, yeah, we, uh, things are cheaper, velocity slower, um, and you, you see it in prices and, and transaction volume out there from an economic perspective, not talking about markets. Thank you, Wayne. Our next question comes in from Luke. What do you think will be some of the ramifications of the government's recent immense deficit spending? How do you expect it will impact inflation, interest rates, social programs, et cetera? Uh, sorry, so I think that's... Um me as well. Um, it is a long-term impact in, in the sense that when you think through that, uh, or if we think about the stimulus, the stimulus that kind of initially came in, uh, I'm talking about the fiscal stimulus, uh, came in to support the individual. Um, but the next round stimulus and some of the purchases that even that the Fed, uh, that the Fed is uh, kind of disclosing and putting out there, it does uh, percolate or kind of fall down into uh, municipalities um, and, and corporates. Uh, and I think right now it's, you're just letting the government kind of uh, serve as that social net across kind of businesses and individuals. Um, I think it's necessary right now uh, in the sense of it just kind of creates a, st a stabilization uh, or a floor to uh, the economy. Um, and it is meant to be somewhat stimulative. Uh, I, I do think there's a general kind of expectation that there's going to be a need for more. Um, but uh, it, it probably is not yet enough. Uh, and we'll see uh, kind of additionally, additional stimulative measures coming down the pike. Uh, I, I think a lot of the question does kind of fall into, and I think whether it's economic, uh, kind of, or from a long-term kind of monetary policy or kind of balance sheet kind of ramification perspective, how much longer will this persist, right? Like we, ha we had a huge amount of flash with some of the uh, kind of the headline numbers that came out really early with, uh, with kind of the phase two and, and kind of the federal actions. But if we were to paint a picture where this was supposed to extend out another couple, two, three quarters, What's next? What, what else can we do to stimulate the economy? And that's why I think there's so much focus on um, kind of getting the economy and getting people back into a, a productive state. And what does that rollout look like? And I think that's what we'll ultimately need um, to kind of reaccelerate the economy and reaccelerate markets. Thank you, Wayne. Next question comes in from Sherry. Is the U.S. in better shape to weather this downturn compared to other countries internationally? Um, I could take that one. And I, I think I'll, if I could just add one comment to Wayne's earlier points, you know, Chairman Powell made a comment last week that his intentions were to kind of unwind QE and put monetary policy back into a more normal positioning when um, 
the the pandemic eventually subsides. Uh, I hope that's the case. I really hope that they um, they as in the Fed respond quicker to normalize monetary policy um, than they did in 2008. Uh, just because I don't want to see us in a position where we're we're consistently viewing the Fed as as the buyer of last resort, and um, it increases our appetite for risk, knowing that um, we have the Fed support uh, no matter what happens in the world. So I hope Chairman Powell uh, takes that seriously, uh, his comments, and does, in fact, try to um, get interest rates and unwind the Fed's balance sheet at a quicker pace than, than they did post-2008. Uh, the question that you just asked, Darcy, I do believe, we do believe that the U.S. is better positioned than the rest of the world uh, to weather this. And our, our thinking there is that the U.S. was in a stronger position financially coming into this uh, pandemic and recession. And the, uh, you know, the U.S. Uh, Treasury and Fed have responded quickly and aggressively to support markets. Uh, so we, we, we are of the view that uh, the U.S. is structurally um, more prepared to handle um, this pandemic and recession with, you know, the rationale there being uh, our GDP growth, you know, was call it 2% uh, plus or minus coming into this. Uh, we were already in a relatively low interest rate environment. Uh, you know, we had uh, just weathered, obviously, the 2008 crisis uh, 12 years prior, and I think we're in a position where our monetary policy uh, could be put to work quickly, right? We we had a playbook to work from uh, the last time around, so we're able to act quickly enough this time to give us some support. Time will tell if it's enough, uh, but as we think about our positioning um, on the global stage, we are concentrating our exposure for client portfolios in in U.S. businesses, U.S. investments uh, that we think will be better positioned uh, coming out of this, especially with, I think, the, the, the technology and healthcare industries uh, likely leading the way um, where we believe on a global scale um, we have kind of, for those sectors, some uh, leading companies that will deliver a lot of opportunity for clients. Thank you, Chris. Our next question comes in from Peter, and he writes, what is the firm's view on pace of economic recovery? Without testing, vaccination, and or treatments available, the experts I've read seem to think economic activity will be halted at best. And these tests, vaccinations, and treatments seem to be months, if not years, away. I can uh, start, and Wayne can certainly add in. Um, you know, that's really the million-dollar question right now, is, is when, when are we restarting? When is the economy restarting? Um, I think if the, the federal government or state governments uh, decide to slowly begin to let people back to work and back to normal behavior. Uh, the question is, is it everyone? Is it um, just those that have the antibodies or previously tested positive for the virus? Uh, is it certain sectors? You know, the, uh, the ramifications of the shutdown are, it's too early to know what they will be uh, longer term, uh, because you know certainly the 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 question um, is right on, and that vaccinations are, are not expected anytime soon, and definitely production on a national scale is even um, further out than that. So, uh, you know, what does this mean for third quarter and fourth quarter GDP growth? Uh, I think it's it's too early to know. Uh, the market is definitely 
aware of the potential for it to get a whole lot worse for it before it gets better, uh, that would likely drive further volatility in equity prices. Um, it could also drive further stimulus uh, from the Treasury and the Fed. Uh, I, I, I personally wouldn't wouldn't be surprised if the Fed has already mentally committed to moving rates even lower, such that we're in a you know negative rate environment um, on you know credit markets here in the U.S. Uh, it, it's it's very very possible should we need that kind of stimulus. Thank you, Chris. Next, we have a question and a comment that have come in from Jay, and he writes, since studying economics used to be called political economy, what is a democratic, a democratic win in November? Also, as a person in the global supply chain, I can say it is an absolute mess. Cleaning it up will take time. Why do you think a recovery can occur until it sorts itself out? Um, maybe I'll start. Uh, I majored in economics, uh, so maybe I have some comments around that. But uh, the uh, maybe a couple points. Uh, I think, firstly, on the on who wins the presidency uh, in November, um, whoever it is, whether uh, kind of Trump renews or uh, Biden comes in. The economy will have uh, still the economy will still be in a position where it's sorting itself out, and kind of regardless of kind of big uh, kind of general kind of political leanings to, uh, between Republicans and Democrats, uh, they will need to be uh, in a situation where they're fixing the economy and fixing uh, the uh, the general pace of growth for the economy. So. Uh, in the kind of near to medium term, um, I think that will be the, the main focus. Now, the path to be a little bit different in terms of kind of where do you spend more time on versus less. But uh, I don't necessarily think that there's going to be big, dramatic uh, kind of policy changes kind of off the get-go. Um, I think they'll, they'll have long-term strategic goals that in a more stable uh, world where we are kind of past the pandemic, I think there can be changes from that perspective. But in the near term, I think it's to avoid uh, inconsistency uh, or rocking the boat, I think there will be a uh, a steady focus on making sure that there's capital available, that it's flowing to uh, consumers as well as corporates, um, and I think the focus will just be uh, be more on the persistence of fiscal stimulus, uh, because I think from a monetary perspective, we're doing as much as we can. Um, and I think just kind of even looking at uh, kind of uh, through that 08 period and uh, I know political kind of structures were a little bit different there. Or political kind of control was a little bit different there. Uh, the focus was more just on stabilization as opposed to trying to push through big uh, kind of political agendas at that point. So, um, yeah, so yes, there will be longer term ramifications and obviously a Republican uh, uh, Congress or administration uh, technically would be more uh, positive to uh, kind of markets. Um, I, I think that's a much longer term view than a something that that's in, currently in a crisis mode. Um, and kind of tying that into the, the follow on question of um, kind of what will cause the economy. Uh, if I Jay, if you're on, please let us know if we can kind of clarify on this. But yeah, the, the logistical supply chain is bad uh, in the sense that uh, China had hit, uh, we're coming into a weird market, right? Because if you think about year end, we were still uh, looking at uh, US-China trade tensions and we just kind of signed off and agreed to uh, uh, new trade terms that kind of would have put China in a position to start ramping up pretty quickly with the U.S. Uh, in a kind of continual uh, kind of cyclical growth cycle. And then this virus hit and China shut down, then the U.S. shut down. Now China starting to open up with a lower demand kind of expectation for kind of global consumption. Uh, Europe is still in its own, uh, kind of, depending on which country has is still going through this or is trying to come out of this. So uh, I do agree that there is 
uh, there's there's going to be some noise, and it's not going to and it's not going to be as synchronous in terms of meeting supply and demand. Um, equity markets are trying to look through that. Uh, so there is, I would say, there is a pull forward of future earnings uh, in a more stabilized market that that the market's trying to price in currently. Um, but it's a little bit different. I think there's winners and losers here, um, or and maybe it's not dramatic as winners and losers, but like kind of looking at the S and P uh, having a lot of large cap, uh, technologically driven companies kind of leading uh, that index. Uh, maybe you point to the NASDAQ as being even more so kind of emphasizing that element and their recovery versus looking at like the Russell 2000 being just kind of domestic, smaller, more cyclically uh, uh, correlated companies. And the larger the company, the more service or tech oriented, the better it's performing from a stock perspective because they do have lower costs, uh, they have wider margins, uh, they have more flexibility to their business. But I think the smaller uh, you know, companies that are more uh, manufacturing or production oriented, there will be a more persistent pain there. And looking at 08, um, the markets came back pretty quickly in 09 and 10, but the economy really took several more years to really kind of get back to uh, a steady state. And I don't think that's going to be that different from this time around. So. I think the headline of the S&P will probably uh, kind of uh, look beyond this over the next couple of years, but Russell, uh, small caps, uh, more cyclical businesses, high yield. Now, the credit markets uh, definitely aren't showing the same kind of resiliency as what we're seeing in the equity markets because high yield companies and not looking at like the mega cap companies that fell into high yield, but smaller high yield companies are more cyclically sensitive and are more manufacturing focused than they're seeing significant pain. Uh, there's knock-on effects there too, and we're going to see uh, high in default, higher unemployment, um, and it'll take time to work through that. The equity markets just happen to pull forward uh, future earnings um, at a faster pace in a low rate environment uh, to drive some of this rebound that we're seeing right now. I don't know if that fully answers it, or maybe if, if it addresses it at all, but um, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Wayne. Um, I've been receiving some comments through the, the chat window. Um, so as, as a follow up, I'll add that Jay writes, uh, trade flow was going down in the beginning of November and COVID-19 put that on steroids. Yep. Currently, yep. there is a real mess. 150 very large container ships were taken out of the market. Wouldn't you allocate to Asia or EM where there is more consistency? Yeah, uh, to the first comment there, yeah, I, I think the comments of kind of reduction in trade flow and uh, utilization and manufacturing have been falling off, and that was probably the knock-on effect of just uncertainty around trade between China and the U.S. to begin with, uh, and it was the expectation that that was going to turn around pre-COVID uh, with, with the U.S.-China trade agreement being in place. That was supposed to ameliorate and kind of inflect higher, but then COVID hit before they even got off the ground and, and now we're here. Um, to the second point, would you allocate to Asia or EM? I mean, you can look at China, uh, Taiwan, Korea, Singapore and saying, okay, maybe they're kind of normalizing and kind of getting to uh, Japan and they're getting to a place where uh, they've kind of stabilized and kind of contained COVID and are now in a production phase. But our general view, this echoes some of the comments that Chris made was that the U.S. is still uh, the major economy, a major consuming market, um, and if the U.S. hasn't yet fully been able, to, from an economic perspective, hasn't fully been able to uh, stabilize and uh, kind of reaccelerate its growth, uh, uh, production economies, export economies will still be beholden to what the U.S. to the U.S. the strength of the U.S. economy. So yeah, Asia is cheaper. Emerging markets are cheaper. Uh, but because there is a second derivative effect of them reliant on U.S. on the strength of the U.S. economy, uh, we are we would rather be more defensive. Well, we would argue that it's more defensive to be in domestic large caps than to try to reach out to uh, Asia or EM or or export economies that that will kind of be beholden to the U.S. Thank you for that, Wayne.
We have a follow-up question from Peter. The firm has for a long time now felt that illiquid alternatives would pay an additional premium relative to other asset classes. Is it your view that the expected premium is now enhanced or di diminished? Why? I could take that one. Um, I, a lot of the dollars that we have committed to the illiquid alternative space um, in the last year or so are still not yet called. Uh, in many cases, the, the, the fund managers are called 30% or 40% called. Um, we think the certainly the dollars that are at work are uh, those businesses are subject to um, revenue cuts and um, certainly major impacts to their cash flow from consumers not being out and about and spending and manufacturing slowing down every industry and sector um, shutting down. The companies that are in those portfolios today are, are not immune to that. Uh, they will be impacted by that. Uh, you know, many of them are drawing down on, um, you know, their lines of credit from their banks and looking to, you know, refinance <clears throat> wherever they can to shore up cash flow. So those companies um, are leaning on their private equity firms and management heavily um, to guide them through this, this period. The dollars that are not yet to work um, by, not yet called and put to work by the private equity or venture funds that we're allocating to are in a great position to do one of two things. One, support current businesses in the portfolio that are in need of additional capital or um, invest in new businesses that are all of a sudden trading at a much uh, deeper discount to where they were previously. Uh, as liquidity dries up and appetite for risk dries up, uh, a lot of these fund managers are now in a position where they're looking at businesses they've liked for a long time and can now purchase at much lower prices. We had a venture fund reach out just two weeks ago with a, an example where um, they paid half as much for a company um, that they were looking at in just January, February of this year um, and interested in buying in that time. So it, it does give them opportunity to put money to work at much cheaper prices. I suspect they are all being hyper aware of the potential for an, an extended economic uh, downturn and, you know, wanting to be as um, underexposed to that as possible, but also wanting to have cash available uh, should the situation get worse and should some of these companies offer even more attractive valuations. The second thing I would add is that we're doing in the illiquid universe is the illiquid alternatives that we're finding attractive today are not the same ones that we were finding attractive in January of this year. Uh, we're, we're looking at uh, distressed for example, there's a distressed manager that we like a lot uh, that is putting money to work amidst this turmoil and will likely do so for the next 18 to 36 months. They're uniquely positioned to be buying um, distressed credit in many cases um, that would generate returns similar to a you know, buyout private equity fund, right? High teens, low 20s. And yet uh, the downside risk is a whole lot less because you're buying credit instead of equity. In many cases, it's collateralized by strong assets. Uh, we're also looking at, we mentioned last week, uh, a TALF strategy. Um, we're looking at uh, other kind of strategies within structured credit where the return profile is very attractive, whether it's high teens or low 20s. Um, but the risk profile is a whole lot lower than a typical private equity investment that would generate those kinds of returns in normal times. So we still see a lot of opportunity in illiquid alternatives. We're, um, we're committed to the managers that we've been investing in and think that they will weather the storm quite well. Uh, but we are also finding new ideas with an even better risk return profile based on uh, the world we're in right now. Thank you, Chris. 
Our next question comes in from Jay and he writes, was the economy in 0809 as robust as in pre-COVID 2020? Wouldn't the strength of the economy make for a quicker recovery? Uh, I'll comment a little bit and then uh, Chris could jump in, but um, Oh wait, the, the, the global financial crisis uh, was, if you were to really kind of narrow it down, it, it was the over leveraging in banks uh, or called financial institutions and uh, the over leveraging and uh, loose covenants of uh, the housing market, particularly in the subprime space uh, with subprime, uh, was kind of subprime, uh, uh, borrowers in, on second, third homes with no documentation. Um, it made it look like uh, you had a high quality buyer that ultimately was not. Um, and then when that kind of part of the market started falling apart, uh, the banks and uh, kind of other kind of lenders to that market realized how much underlying risk they actually had and they had greater leverage at that period of time. Uh, other segments of the market, while being over levered, um, I think uh, uh, we're we're okay. They're they're doing okay. I would say the economy was actually slowing down into the in in oh seven. Uh, so uh, you saw the pain slowly and gradually coming down the the mountain uh, from let's call it late summer of oh seven through oh eight. And this is even pre uh, pre Lehman, right? Like 07, you had a quant crisis. You had uh, subprime uh, deals falling apart. Remember Bear Stearns Asset Management? Before Bear Stearns went under, Bear Stearns uh, Asset Management had a couple uh, uh, funds uh, kind of go under. Uh, you had hung bridges happening in the latter part of 07, despite equity markets uh, continually rallying. And then in 08, uh, that's when you start seeing a lot more pressure and illiquidity in the system. But then you hit late 08 with Lehman kind of really being the nexus of the pain. Um, that's when the markets really kind of collapsed really hard and dramatically. But that was several quarters of kind of just watching the markets uh, and fundamentals continue to deteriorate. Uh, and to Jay's comment earlier uh, to his question, that's a bit different from what we're seeing kind of pre uh, pre COVID in the sense that, yeah, uh, multiples are getting higher cause light uh, kind of risk in, in creditors were getting uh, 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 more uh, kind of more widely used, but fundament fundamentals and earnings and earnings quality were still pretty good. And we're into, uh, we're just about to reaccelerate into another kind of cyclical growth uh, part of the economy as, as uh, just on the back of the trade deal too. So the economy was on much stable footing uh, with much better financial uh, kind, of kind of financial structures, both on the leverage side and on the financial market side uh, this time around than it was in 08. Um, 08, that pain lasted for a couple of years uh, before we started kind of seeing the, the, the growth or the expansion. This time around, it's gonna be really deep and on a relative basis, likely shorter. Um, but uh, I think the real uncertainty is just that what that uh, kind of how how short is short or can it get much longer than that kind of shorter expectation. But yeah, I think that's why we're seeing so much more expectations for a dramatic kind of reacceleration of the economy once we kind of get over uh, this pandemic. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, I'm gonna, sorry, were you gonna add something there, Chris? I was just going to add, uh, you know, I think heading into 082, uh, interest rates were a whole lot higher, right? So GDP growth um, was definitely slightly higher. I think it was kind of in the low to mid threes heading into 08. Um, but interest rates were also higher, you know, Fed funds rate at four or five percent. Uh, whereas this time around, certainly GDP growth was, was lower, um, but interest rates were significantly lower. Uh, so Theoretically, that that should um, provide stimulus to the economy in such a way that um, it aids in the recovery. 
Thanks, Chris. So I'm going to shift gears here. Um, we're going to move into the financial planning portion of the call and we're going to address a question that was submitted by Patricia. I read about Roth IRA conversions in your recent article for financial planning strategies to implement during a market downturn. What are the benefits of converting your IRA account and why is now a good time to do so? Thanks, Darcy. Um, this is truly a very interesting year for IRA conversions. Um, the current crisis has led to a number of factors that have uh, created a great opportunity for some individuals to convert traditional IRAs to Roth IRAs. As most are probably aware, with traditional IRAs, the distributions are taxable and uh, you're required now to begin those distributions at age 72. Now, once you distribute the assets from the IRA, not only do you have to pay taxes on those assets, you also lose that tax-free growth. Um, in comparison, Roth IRAs, distributions are tax-free, and there are actually no distribution requirements. Um, this allows assets to continue to compound tax-free, which is extremely beneficial. Like traditional IRAs, Roth IRAs left to a spouse can also be treated as their own, um, allowing for even more tax-free growth. And when the Roth IRAs are left to the next generation, um, a beneficiary is 10 years before the assets must be distributed tax-free. I mean, this is a huge opportunity to grow assets uh, for the next generation. It can be a very valuable tool in an estate plan. Um, so you may ask, you know, what are the particular factors that make this year such an attractive year to convert? Um, first, if we talk about the negatives of converting, you're basically, when you convert an IRA, you're pulling forward taxes. The balance you convert is taxable as ordinary income in the year you convert it. Um, this is true for both federal and state taxes, um, unless you're lucky enough to live in a state without income tax, which is a further benefit to the strategy. Um, basically, the lower your tax rate, the better an IRA conversion works. IRA account values currently right now with this crisis are depressed, um, so there's less of a taxable impact upon converting them. Um, and if they are converted, any rebound in the asset values, which occur inside the new Roth IRA account, uh, will be tax-free. Uh, the volatility this year has really led to a lot of tax loss harvesting opportunities. Um, this is going to bring portfolio income down for the year, uh, also possibly lowering an, an individual's tax rate. Um, and this also makes conversions more beneficial. Um, we saw that there was recently passed the Stimulus Act called the CARES Act. Um, this act allows individuals to skip the required distributions on a, both a traditional IRA and inherited IRAs for 2020. Um, this can further lower an individual's income for the year, um, increasing the benefits of a conversion. Um, also, for small business owners, Net operating losses can be used to offset income from a conversion. There's a limit of up to 80%. Um, however, there is discussions around a four stage of stimulus and they're talking about eliminating this limit. Finally, um, an another way that a conversion income can be offset is through charitable contributions. Um, and we've seen a lot of clients increase contributions this year. Um, you can even use a donor advised fund um, to pull forward multiple years of gifting uh, to receive a larger deduction in this year um, to offset the impact um, from the conversion. Uh, it's also important to point out, you know, when you convert an IRA to a Roth IRA, you're also eliminating those f future taxable distributions. So a, a combination of all these factors, um, you know, some uh, don't pertain to everyone, but a combination of them can really turn into a very attractive opportunity for some people to convert. Um, our advisor is going to be closely looking at IRA conversions as part of, part of our client's broader financial plan. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I think it's a, a really great strategy to consider and really raises the broader point that even when markets are in disarray, there are strategies that you can put in place to take some control over your financial life. So thank you for that. Thank you. You're welcome. At this time, there are no remaining questions in the queue.
I'd like to thank everyone on the line for taking some time out of their day to participate in today's call. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Darcy. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. And thank you, Bill. Thank you, Darcy. Thanks everyone joining. If you have any additional questions that we were not able to address during the call, please do not hesitate to send them to me at dobryan at simonquickadvisors.com and we would be happy to address them offline. Thanks again for joining us and have a great evening.